Mario Puzo wrote The Godfather novel in 1969. Francis Ford Coppola wrote and directed the film version in 1972. He followed it up with parts two and three in 1974 and 1990. Famed life photographer Steve Shapiro was on set for all three movies. And this is his photo album. So this is the Godfather family album, uh, which I edited. It's photographs by Steve Shapiro throughout the book. It's a nice uh, format published by Tashin to celebrate their 40th anniversary. We've got a flap here, which you can fold back into place, out of the way. So the format of the book is telling the stories of the Godfather movies uh, from beginning to the end. It begins with an introduction by Mario Puzo about the writing of his novel and his work or his experiences on the first Godfather movie. And then we've got chapters on each of the movies. So we have a foreword by Steve Shapiro where he talks about his experiences on the movie and photographing Pacino, Brando, De Niro, and everybody else. And uh, so the introduction from Mario Puzo here, uh, it's got some great stories. He talks about, I mean, most people think that he you know, knew a lot about the mafia, etc., and that he worked with them, but actually it's all from research. Although after the book came out and when the movie was uh, being made and after the movie came out, the first movie, Puso did get, you know, a lot of his gambling debts paid for by, by people, um, unknown people who may or may not be mafia. He would have his would have champagne brought to him. So there are lots of uh, nice little stories from him. Mainly, he's complaining about money, uh, which all writers do, uh, in my experience. So basically, Puzo wrote The Godfather in order to pay off all the debts that he had from writing two more arty novels earlier in his life. So while Puzo was having talks with Paramount, the production company, he talked to Robert Evans, the head of the studio, and Evans said, you know, I think we should have Robert Redford to play Michael Corleone, the central character. And Puzo thought, no, that's a really bad idea, he doesn't look Italian. On the other hand, Puzo said, well look, I think we should have Brando, Marlon Brando, as, as the godfather, Vito Corleone. But Evan said, no, it's, he's not good. He's box office poison, he's difficult to work with, it wouldn't work out. Although, as it happened, he wasn't difficult to work with and he worked out great in the movie. It was Peter Barr who came up with the idea of hiring Francis Ford Coppola to direct the movie. He was Italian-American. He'd had a few, you know, not so successful movies, and so he'd be cheap. And as it happened, that was a great idea. There's some great pictures in here from, from Steve Shapiro. There's one here of Brando being carried upstairs on, on a stretcher. He's laughing, uh, mainly because he put extra weights in the stretcher in order to make it more difficult for the actors to, to pick him up. They were always playing tricks like that on, on the set. And I think that's one of the things that is really interesting. It gives a very familial feel to the movie because everybody was had that sort of jokey feeling um, uh, on set and it, it transferred into the, the filming. You really felt that these people were getting along. Um, the, James Kahn at, at one stage during the scene, uh, he felt so relaxed, he just picked up some walnut, walnut you know, from the, from the table, from the bowl. And Brando, in character, looked at him, because it was a very serious, very serious scene, and sort of, and gave him a, a talking to, completely ad-libbed, un, unscripted. And 
you know, and it really worked for, for, for the part. That was one of Coppola's great strengths as a director on set. He allowed the actors to be free, to be who they were, to be in, in the moment with the characters. And because of that, they would often do things that, that were in character, but added to the, uh, to, the, to the feeling of the movie. So in Godfather Part 2, Robert De Niro and Al Pacino, they never meet. They never meet in the movie. But uh, there was one day when they were on set together on, in different scenes. And so Steve Shapiro got them together for the, the only images of them. So the story of the Godfather is told in scene order. So we have Godfather Part 1, and we include uh, quotes from the movie. So as we go through, through the book, I've included interviews and articles about the movies. Uh, the first one here, Becoming the Godfather by Shana Alexander from, from Life. It's a very good interview with Brando. Uh, he's telling what, what it's like in order to be a, an actor. You know, Brando talks about ego. If you're not talking about the actor, he's not listening. And here we can see Steve Shapiro's uh, photographs of Dick Smith, uh, the makeup artist, turning Brando, who was actually quite young at the time, into a much older man, using the teeth, etc. And Dick Smith had this great thing where he would take small wax figures of how he thought the makeup should look. And Steve has photographed them here, and you can see just how how close the final version are to these these little figures. So we have these very joyful outdoor scenes of a wedding, contrasting with the very dark scenes, the interior scenes, where Don Vito is, is doing business. You know, it's shady, murky, so it's dark. And in fact, Gordon Willis, the cinematographer, planned it that way um, with, with Coppola. And also he planned it so that the lights from were always from the top, so that the Godfather's eyes were always in shadow, so you couldn't see his eyes. And if you can't see his eyes, you can't see what he's thinking. So it becomes much more mysterious as a character. So all this was planned, even though it's filmed in what seems like a quite naturalistic way. So we come here to the assassination attempt on Don Vito. And this was actually shot in Mulberry Street in New York. And Nicholas Pelleggi, who's now well known for Wise Guy, which was turned into the film Goodfellas, directed by Martin Scorsese. Uh, he wrote an on-set report for the New York Times. It's good reading. What he did was he talked to some of the mafia guys who were a couple of streets away, and they were actually looking and commenting on Brando and his appearance. And they were saying, you know, you know, wise guys, they don't, they don't dress like that. They would never have a hat you know, blocked in that way. They would never have a pin, should be properly blocked. There are photos from deleted scenes or cut scenes in the movie that we see behind the scenes. Here we have a, an oral history by Peter Biskind, who's known for Easy Riders Raging Bulls. And this tells the, the making of the movie from the point of view of lots of people on the, on the set. One of the great stories they tell is that Coppola was on the verge of being fired from the movie. The studio didn't really like the dailies. They thought things were going wrong. They were getting not very good reports. But luckily, Coppola then won an Oscar for his screenplay for Patton. And that changed things around. All of a sudden, he could stay on the movie and he got a reprieve. Now, when people talk about sequels never being as good as the original. People always point out the exception is The Godfather Part 2, and it's a great example. Part 2 tells two parallel stories. The first is the story of Don Vito as a boy leaving Sicily and travelling to America as an immigrant and growing up there. And it's about his journey to become The Godfather. And the other parallel story is Michael Corleone, uh, after the death of his father, becoming Godfather and what he has to do. So it's about the reasons why they do what they do. 
So this is great Playboy interview with Al Pacino, uh, conducted by Lawrence Grabel. And what's great about it is that Pacino explains how difficult it was for him to do nothing. Pacino is a, is a very gregarious, he's always moving. Steve Shapiro talks about this as well, and how difficult it was sometimes to get him to sit still for, for photographs. Uh, but in this movie, he plays Michael as somebody who is trying to keep everything together. He's very internalised, he's very repressed, because ultimately he has to make decisions that will affect his family and, and cause harm to his own family. And uh, this tension actually led Puccino to have a, a nervous breakdown and production had to stop for a little while in order for him to, to recover. So there are a lot of pressures on, not just on Pacino, but on everybody else on the movie in order to live up to the success of the first movie. And by golly, they achieved it. All the classic scenes are in here. And Steve was there for every single one of these great moments. There's also a Playboy interview with Francis Ford Coppola uh, by William Murray. Coppola is a writer a fantastic writer and he does an enormous amount of research and puts a lot of thought into his scripts. I mean he understands what each word and each moment and each movement, he understands what they all mean. So for example, there's a great quote from him where he says that the Godfather is the story of a great king who had three sons and each got a different part of his palace. Michael got his cunning Sonny his hot temper, and Alfredo his sweetness. So Coppola had a really deep understanding of what, what the characters meant and who they were. And obviously as a director, he helped transfer this meaning to the actors. Part two was released in 1974, and Coppola thought that was it, as far as he was concerned. But he was persuaded to return for part three, which was released in 1990. If you thought Coppola was under a lot of pressure to make a success out of part two, he was under even more pressure on part three. Barbara Harrison shows this in her set report. There was pressure from fans, there was pressure from Paramount, there was pressure from Coppola himself, who obviously wanted to make the very best movie he could, but he also wanted to make a different movie. Michael wants to leave his mafia life behind by contributing to charities, by helping people in the world. But just when he thought he was out, he's pulled back in. He tries to get forgiveness from his family, from his children, but he's not forgiven. And in the end, he loses them. In the end, he dies alone. A broken man. I'm sure it's not a sin to pick up the Godfather Family album. In fact, I believe it's an offer you cannot refuse. <laughs>